we're going to follow the same format that we did on Wednesday and Friday, which is this is a discussion and this is a demonstration. So I want you guys to participate. I'll stop and ask some questions. You guys chime in and uh, we'll make this more exciting if you guys participate with me. So please do that. But you're also at the same time you are taking notes and that's just an opportunity for me to give you some credit for being here. We'll give you some points. Uh, we're not gr grading specifically. Oh, you missed this one particular thing. We want you to figure out what's important. I'll help you with that. If I say something's important or write this down or I spell something, that's your cue. You guys know how the note taking works. You guys are smart kids. So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to collect the, uh, we're going to take some notes for a couple of times. Uh, once we get through several of these tools, we'll have a quiz, but we'll give you a chance to review all that. So it won't be a surprise. I know several of you have used this maybe multiple times. Tell me somebody who what this is. A jigsaw. Jigsaw, thank you. Tell me something about the jigsaw. What's it good for? What's it not good for? It's good for cutting holes. OK. That's a good start. It's good for cutting on the wood, but it's hard to make sharp turns. OK. OK, good. You can't make a sharp corner, but you can make gradual radiuses and it's actually really good at that. So. If I'm trying to make a. What else we got good for cutting plywood? Yes, Ben, good answer. Uh, good for cutting thin materials, so I'm not going to try to cut through a four by four or a six by six big timber. I'm going to be cutting thinner materials probably up to a two by four, but usually more think like plywood, half inch, three quarter inch plywood, quarter inch plywood. It's great for plywood. It's not great for straight lines. So if I want to cut a long straight line, very long and straight, this probably isn't the right tool. It, it will cut, but it, it's going to be maybe a little bit jagged or a little bit, uh, a little bit wavy. There are better tools. A panel saw or a table saw is going to give you a straighter cut. Uh, you can do it. It's just not that's not where it's uh, strength lies. It's strength lies in intricate cuts. OK, so think about the name jigsaw and think about a jigsaw puzzle and how I can make uh, those curved shapes, right? Like a jigsaw puzzle. That's where it's going to be the strongest. Uh, we generally think of a jigsaw as for plywood or wood, wood materials. However, with the right blade, you can cut metal, you can cut plastic with the correct blade, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but make sure you got the right blade, you can cut other materials. Let's talk about some of the features about the jigsaw, okay? Uh, this is going to be 20 volt DC lithium ion battery, just like the drill, just like the impact driver. The battery slides into the back of the tool right here, clicks in, and we're ready to go. That's all the same. That's good news. One battery, all these different tools. Uh, the next thing here, feature wise, I, I did say we're taking notes, right? I think we covered that. The next thing, so just like the drill and the impact driver, there's a trigger. And if you didn't write this down last time, I would write down variable speed. B A R I A B L E. Variable speed. All that means is the more I press, the faster it goes. Just like in your, uh, your car, your truck press on the gas pedal, press on the accelerator. The more you press, the faster it goes. The more I squeeze the trigger, the faster it goes. Variable speed. OK, this one also has a little button right here near the trigger. And you might be confused because you said on the uh, on the on the drill or on the impact driver that made it go backwards, right? That changed the rotation from clockwise to counterclockwise. I could reverse the rotation, right? On the jigsaw, it's a safety. It looks like a reversing, but it's just a lockout. So if I press that on, basically locks the trigger, so I cannot depress the trigger. OK, just a safety. So if I press that off, now I can squeeze the trigger again. All right, spinning around this way. This has a toolless blade change. OK, so if I, if this is a blade, for example, we'll talk more about these in a minute. If this is the blade. If I want to change the blade, I don't need a tool. I don't need a wrench or a, a screwdriver. I simply just pull on this little lever right here in the front with my finger. What that does is there's a jaw in there. It opens up. 
I can insert the blade down in there and then I let go and that clicks it in there, right? And then if I want to release the blade, and I'm going to show you here, hopefully, if I want to drop the blade out, I'm going to just open that up and the blade releases, okay? So it does not need a tool to change the blade. That's a toolless change. You can write that one down. T-O-O-L, tool, L-E-S-S, -S, toolless change, blade change. Okay, back to the saw. Another important feature is the bottom here. This base, the flat part on the bottom, is called the shoe. S-H-O-E, shoe just like you put on your foot. Okay, the shoe is important for the stability. So when you're using the jigsaw, I want to have the shoe flat on the board as flat as possible, okay? And exaggerated, not tipped forward or backwards, okay? And not tipped side to side. I want to get that shoe nice and flat. It's going to give me a better cut. Just as a reference, I don't think you'll ever want to use it. I don't recommend it. You can angle this shoe. So you can see here's my blade moving up straight up and down. If I come to the back here and I find this little lever, I can move that lever to the side. It will allow me to, it'll allow me to rotate that shoe to cut on an angle. It's, in my opinion, not very useful. We've got, if you only had this jigsaw was your only tool and you needed to cut an angle, you might be able to use that. In this fabrication lab, we've got better ways to cut an angle. The reason I'm telling you this is if you ever pick this up and it's loose or something like that, that might be the cause. And just check to make sure that that's square before you start cutting. Okay, next feature. Next feature is right here, this little lever. It is on zero right now. I can rotate this little lever, one, two, and three. This is kind of advanced, who knows this one? There's a little picture on there. Maybe you can see. Zero, one, two, three. Does it represent the cutting speed? Good guess, but not quite. Let me see what we got over here. Rua says angle. Huey says blade pitch. You guys are getting on the right track, but you're not quite there. It's called orbital action. Okay, so... In on a zero setting, the jigsaw moves straight up and down. The saw blade moves straight up and down. That's pretty good, but I can make the blade, I can make a faster cut if I make the blade move in an arc like this, in an orbit, an orbital action. So the orbital action is actually coming downward, moving in toward the wood, making a deeper cut, and then drawing back up. Okay? Let me show you something. Hang on. We're going to switch over to share. And we're going to go to here. Take a look at this little graphic. It probably does a better job than I can. Uh, the straight cut, the blade moving straight up and down. You get a smooth but unaggressive cut. Okay, there's always a compromise, right? What is the trade-off? Well, the orbital cut, the blade moves, as you can see in the little uh, photograph there, the diagram, the blade is moving down, and then it's actually arcing forward in an orbit, and then drawing it up. The advantage is that I get a faster, aggressive cut. But there's that disadvantage. Anybody know? What's the trade-off? What do you think? What do you think I have to sacrifice? Rougher edges. Rougher edges. Thank you. That's exactly yeah. right. Oh, thank you, Brewer. Very kind of you. Very kind of you, John Brewer. You're the first one that's ever thought of that. I, I'm seriously. Um, right. Always a trade-off. In this case, you can go faster. It's gonna it's gonna make a more aggressive cut by doing that orbiting action, but you're gonna probably get more tear out, more splintering, just not as smooth as edge. And also something you might think about, if you are trying to make those intricate cuts and curves, 
by making that blade move in that more orbital action, it's going to be a little bit more restrictive as how tight of a bend you can make. Okay. Moving on. Battery recovered, trigger recovered, lockout recovered, blade changing recovered, uh, shoe, and orbital action. So let's go back to the blade for a minute because I want to tell you something and I'm going to share again. We're going to go to the next slide. There we go. We have two different types of blades that are common for jigsaws. Number, uh, the, the first one on the left-hand side there, it says T-shank. You see the shape? Remember the shank is the part of the drill bit, the part of the saw blade, the part of the cutting tool, basically, that we attach to our, our drill or our saw. So the shank on a drill bit was that rounded part where we put into the chuck. On a jigsaw blade, the shank is the part that attaches to the saw. So the T-shank, the one on the left, is the one that we use here for these cordless, toolless change blades. So anytime you see that toolless changeover, where you just use your finger to open it and close it, that's generally almost always going to be a T-shank blade. Okay, that's just very characteristic of the toolless change. That's what locks it in. The U-shank is the older style. It uses a set screw, and you're going to have to have some kind of tool to tighten and loosen that blade, either a little key or a set, uh, screwdriver or a hex key, Allen wrench, that type of tool. All right. Let me stop. Let me exit this for a minute. Go back. OK. Thank you, Brewer, for the photograph again. Screenshot. Uh, here's an example, okay, so as I said, all of our cordless jigsaws that have the toolless change, okay, are going to be the T-shank. If you find a U-shank, you might find one here laying around in a fabrication lab that's left over or on your job site or at home or somewhere else you might encounter a jigsaw. If you see this older style with the U, there's no T on there, it's generally going to fit a saw like this. So here's a uh, one I brought from home. It's a uh, DeWalt jigsaw, but this is an older one with a cord. You can see I got the cord tied on here. Uh, this was a previous generation that used the U-shank. Now, if I look right here, so here's the saw. If I look right up there where the blade attaches, you might be able to see right up in there, there's a little screw, set screw. Set screw means a clamping screw. I'm going to have to have a little tool like this, like an Allen wrench that fits this. Uh, some of the older ones, like a Craftsman, I've seen use a slotted head screw, flat tip. So some kind of little screw is going to be what clamps in the blade rather than the T-shank. So just a reminder, hoping you're writing that down. The T-shank is used for the keyless changeover. So if you don't need a tool, you just use your finger. It's generally going to be that T-shape. And the older ones that use a set screw, now you can't put this in this U-shape when you, if you put this into that toolless thing, it might fit, but it's going to fall back out. There's nothing to hold it in. That little T is what retains the blade. So don't use that kind. Make sure you get the right blade for the right saw. If you're not sure, ask. Okay. T-shank and U-shank. Don't get them mixed up. All right, let's talk a little bit about tooth profile. How are we doing on time? 129. All right, 20 minutes left. We are rolling. Let's go back to the share screen. And we'll go back to blades, sharing, and present. Okay, we talked a little bit about at the beginning. I said this tool can do different kinds of materials as long as you have the right blade. Okay. So again, most common for wood and thin woods like plywood. If you look up at the top, the blade on the upper right, top right, that blade has big teeth with wide spacing between the teeth. 
Okay. The rule of thumb on the left there, when we're looking at blades, if we see big teeth with wide spacing, that's usually going to be just what it's labeled there. It's going to be a faster cut and usually softer materials. So that blade on the top, just as it's labeled, it's going to be fast cuts in wood. Okay. As you can see, you go down a little bit further, down to the third one down, it says clean cut for wood. So it's kind of a in the middle somewhere. The teeth are a little bit smaller, a little bit closer together. I'm going to get a cleaner cut, but I can still cut with wood. If you go down toward the bottom, you look at the bottom two, those are both for metal. The teeth get even closer together and even smaller. So as the teeth get smaller and closer together, generally going to get a smoother finish, but it's going to be for harder materials. Okay, so look at his rule of thumb on the left there. Smaller teeth for harder material. As the teeth get bigger, I can use it on softer material. TPI, you might want to write that down. TPI is teeth per inch. It's just a measurement, a relative measurement. So if I take an inch measurement and I count the number of teeth in there, you guys remember, if you go back a couple of months and we talked in this class, in this very fabrication lab, we talked about fasteners. And we were talking about bolts and screws and how many threads are in an inch. And we talked about metrics in English. And remember the number of threads in an inch or how uh, a, me a way to measure bolts or, or screws. Now we're talking about teeth per inch. So again, we just take a unit of measure, take one inch, count the number of teeth in that inch. If that number is higher, then it is going to be a harder material and smoother cut. If that number goes down, fewer teeth per inch, faster and softer material. Any questions on that? All right, let's bite into the teeth thing a little more. Skip over that. All right, there's two things I want you to know about this slide. You do not have to write down everything. Please don't worry about the bullet points there. We are just going to focus on the little photograph up in the top, okay? Now, or a little, a little diagram. I want you to know two things about that little diagram. The first one is I want you to concentrate on the word gullet, G-U-L-L-E-T. The gullet is the little valley or the little depression between adjacent teeth. So I have one tooth, I pick out a tooth, and then I either go one tooth back or one tooth forward. There's going to be a little depression, a little valley between them, that gullet. And think about the gullet is it's the shovel for the saw blade, right? Let's go back a, a lesson or two, and we talked about drill bits. And the drill bits had a spiral groove that we called a flute. That spiral groove would carry away the sawdust or carry away the metal chips. It basically cleans out the material that's in the way. The gullet does the same thing in a saw blade. The gullet is the shovel that's cleaning out the cleaning out the cut. Okay, so a bigger gullet can hold more, more material. And, and let me also add um, some of these some classes uh, kind of skipped about a little bit. Not only does that gullet or that flute on a drill bit carry away the material, it also carries away the heat. Because as I'm getting rid of those sawdust or as I'm getting rid of those metal shavings, I'm taking the heat away too. And heat is the enemy of a saw blade or a drill bit. Heat will make it dull quicker. So we want to get away that, we want to take away that heat. That's why it's a, another reason why it's important to clean out the cut, whether it's drilling a hole or making a saw cut. Get that cleaned out so we don't keep the heat in. Okay, so gullet is important. And remember, I said I wanted you to know two things about this picture. The other part of this picture that I want you to take note of is the rake. Okay, the rake. And if you look at the three tiny pictures below the main picture, you can see three different examples. A positive rake, a zero rake, and a negative rake. So positive is more of a hook. So the, the hook is pointing in the direction of the cut. So the more aggressive or more pointy that hook is, generally going back to that uh, rule of thumb, that's gonna be softer materials and a faster cut. So in the middle there, we have zero rake. And that's where there's almost no rake at all. It's sort of neutral. The chip, or sorry, the tooth is almost straight up and down. This is gonna be used in sort of, uh, let me back up. This is going to be used for mostly for metals. 
So that straight up and down, zero rake, sort of neutral, it's going to be a metal cutting tube. Not very much rake at all. Now, the last one, the negative one, is actually for composite materials. So I'm kind of in between wood and metal and hardness. Examples of composite materials might be uh, fiberglass or cement board. That's that, that's that rigid um, composite board that you might put behind tiling in your bathroom or underneath a tile floor. It sort of looks like a board made out of cement, if you've ever seen something like that. Those are composites. And the negative rake is what we use on composites. So basically, what I want you to learn from this is positive, neutral, negative, all these, the way the tooth profile is shaped is gives a lot of indication of what that saw blade will be used for. Okay, so when you're in the fabrication lab and you pick up a saw blade, you should be able to quickly look at that saw blade and say, I wonder if this will do the job that I need it to do. And again, if you need help, ask, but you're going to start learning what the different saw blades look like. And um, in that case, you might not have to remember what was on that saw blade because I'll be honest with you, this picture is great. And you're like, oh, great. If I ever need a saw blade, I'll just read what's on the label here. But the unfortunate thing is that the first time you use that saw blade, something happens. The uh, friction of the saw blade wears away the name. You look at this one. You see this saw blade used, and you can see where it used to say some name and labeling. Now it just says medium, and it looks like it starts to say metal, but you can see the name is starting to worn away, right? So unfortunately, uh, that that label on there is great when the saw blade's brand new. But after it's used a few times, that label goes away. So keep in mind, you can always look at the tooth profile and learn a lot. The nice thing about some of these saw blades, if they do put a number up here on the shank, there's that shank again, T-shank. If they put a number on the shank, it gets gripped inside of the saw, and so it's usually protected. So you can always reference that back to a chart or to a Google search and see what you got there. Okay, we're doing great, guys, on time. We're almost done with this one. Um, I do want to talk about another thing, so it's back to the slideshow for a minute. Let me stop for a minute. Are there any questions so far in anything? I don't have any questions. Okay, thank you, Matt. Anything about the tooth profile, the more aggressive tooth, more like a hook is a positive, a neutral rake is sort of straight up and down, and if it's sort of leaning backwards, negative rake, more for composites. Teeth per inch, how close they are together, right? These are the teeth. If that were four teeth per inch, and then I squeezed them all together and I got eight in the same space, in the same inch, that would be eight teeth per inch, right? So usually a number, eight teeth per inch, 20 teeth per inch. How many teeth will fit in one inch? That also determines the type of what the type of blade is. Uh, T-shank and U-shank, different blade types, how they're attached to the saw. Make sure you get the right one. All right, so let's go back to the slideshow then if there aren't any questions on that. And just about, just about wrapped up. Let's look at this. Hang on, I'm not sharing yet. Share first, then pick the slideshow. And then pick present. Okay. Here's a little graphic. These are not my pictures. These are just pictures I'm borrowing. But uh, they kind of show the example of the next thing I want to talk about. The word of the day, write this down, is KERF. K-E-R-F. Now, I can't see the chat, so if you know what a KERF is, just tell me. Who knows what a KERF is? K-E-R-F. I, I don't know what a curf is. Wow, okay. Is so it, is it the um the the space that the blade leaves after it cuts? Exactly right. Who's that? Hannah? Yeah. Awesome, Hannah. You got it. You nailed it. 
So in that bottom picture, the one in the bottom center picture, you're going to see someone started to cut through a piece of wood and they stopped. And what you see is a little slot, a little groove, a little cutout, right, in the wood. That cutout is the same width of the saw blade, the saw blade cutting width, okay? Now, if I cut all the way through a board, the kerf disappears, and you don't, you don't see it anymore. So I put a piece of wood up there. I saw through it. You don't see the kerf anymore. You've got two pieces of wood. And you say, one of these pieces of wood is too short. It may be because you didn't account for the kerf. You can see the kerf could be anywhere from a jigsaw blade, maybe around a sixteenth of an inch thickness. And that's what the saw kerf would be. This saw kerf might be from a table saw or a jig or a uh, I'm sorry, a panel saw where there's a circular blade. Those are usually uh, about an eighth of an inch wide. So. That material that I'm removing has to be taken into account when I cut the board. Otherwise, I'm going to cut off too much. So if we think about a pair of scissors and a piece of paper, when I cut a piece of paper with scissors, there is no kerf. There's no pile of sawdust paper, if you will, when you get done. It cuts right on the line. You don't want to cut right down the middle of the line with a saw blade because you will take off a little bit of each side of the line. Think about the line thickness is very, very narrow, almost, almost negligible, right? Almost very difficult to measure the width of a fine pencil line. A very fine pencil line is very, very narrow, right? The blade, as I said, could be a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch. So when we cut, we always want to go to one side of the line or the other. The side that we want to keep, the board that we measured, and we're going to keep this piece. That's our good side. We want to go, we want to cut on the opposite side of the line. That opposite side, we're going to call the waste side. Waste, W-A-S-T, like trash or throw away, waste, right? That doesn't mean you have to throw that piece away. You can save that for another project. It's just meaning that that's not the side that we're cutting to the dimension. OK, so just just to recap up in the upper left, you measured a board, you drew a line. OK, that's the dimension I want. If I put the saw blade right down the middle of that line, it's going to be too short. And in this case, they use a little common convention is to put that little V mark. That little V mark is to represent that the saw blade goes on the side of the V or that's the waist side. And then when I line up my saw blade in this picture to the right, I want to line up the saw blade so that it's just barely touching the line, but on one side, on that waist side. And then the picture in the middle bottom there, you can see that's kind of like if I stop halfway through, you see how much material is uh, being removed that I have to take into account. Now, if I'm just cutting one piece, no big problem. If I'm cutting several cuts out of one single board, I've got an eight foot long two by four and I want to cut it into several pieces. You could think to yourself, hey, I'm going to save time and I'm simply going to take my pencil and I'm going to make all of the marks at once. I'm going to make all my measurements, draw my lines, and then I'm going to go over and cut it. Well, if you do that, but you don't take into account the kerf, all of your boards could be too short or at least all of the ones after the first one could be too short. So I'm telling you this because the kerf is important because if you don't take it into account, your measurements can be off. And that kerf is equal to basically how wide the blade cuts through the material. The best practice, the one I like to do, is if I'm going to cut multiple cuts in a board, I measure one and then I cut it. Then I start again at zero. Then I measure one and I cut it. The alternative is to, you know, add each time, add the thickness of the blade to each to each dimension. So if I want to get uh, each cut to 12 inches long and I know my blades an eighth of an inch, then I make the first one I measure 12 and then each successive one I got to make 12 plus the saw blade. So 12 and an eighth plus 12 and an eighth plus 12 and an eighth. Right. That can get kind of cumbersome. You can do it but you're introducing a little bit of error. 
Uh, the last method, which we'll talk about maybe one day when we're actually here in the fabrication lab, you're doing repetitive cuts. You all want them to make them the same length. You might set up the saw like a, like a miter saw or the table saw. You use a fence or a stop block so that you're actually, instead of measuring it and drawing a line, you're just moving the wood up against to some reference surface. And then when you're on that reference surface, you can always get the same size cut. All right, any questions about kerf? Kerf, a funny sounding word, funny spelling. Doesn't really mean much except make sure that you account for it if you're making multiple cuts. All right, any questions? Any questions? Any questions? All right. I'll do a quick review. Jigsaw, 20 volt lithium ion battery, just like the other tools. Trigger is variable speed, so I can make the saw go faster or slower. Uh, I have a locking button. I have a keyless tool, uh, blade change. I have the base is the shoe. I have an orbital function. I can make the blade move in an orbital fashion. Makes a faster cut, but the sacrifice is uh, smoothness, right? I'll get a more ragged edge. Uh, I'm not actually going to demonstrate the saw for you. We're too far away from one another. Uh, I think you gain a lot more by actually using it. So we're talking about today, we're talking about features and we're talking about terminology of saw blades. But to actually to do the actual cutting, I want you to have you guys in here. But you guys have seen some of these. This is what it's capable of, right? It's capable of making these sweeping rounded curves. That's what it's good at in thin materials. Uh, last thing, I think the last thing, maybe the last thing. I reserve the right to change my mind if I think something else, but potentially the last thing. This saw that I've been demonstrating right here, we got these about four, I bought these about four years ago with Mr. Gels when we were at Imagineering. Uh, it's been the Boone County system, but a different school before Ignite opened. And we bought these saws, we got a couple of them. And last year, Mr. Gels said, hey, do you wanna get some more jigsaws? I said, yeah, those are very popular. The kids like them, they're easy to use and they're pretty versatile. He said, well, go get a couple more saws. So I went and I said, I'm gonna get the same exact saw, uses the same exact battery, everything. Well, to my surprise, uh, DeWalt had stopped making this exact saw and they made some improvements. So you may see this jigsaw, and if I just go like this, you're probably gonna go, they're the same, but there's some subtle differences, very subtle. The battery, exactly the same. Same battery, same way you insert it. Everything about the battery is the same, no worries, that's good. Trigger, variable speed trigger, same. Keyless blade change, same, yeah, almost, right? This little lever is a little bit different looking. If I put them side by side, you can see the little keyless part is slightly different. This one um, is, is still one-handed tool change, keyless tool change. That's the same, shoes the same, orbital features the same, all that's the same, 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 same. Some little minor differences. Number one, you won't know by looking at it, unless you read the word right here. This is brushless, okay? So this is an improvement in the motor technology, just a little more efficient than the older style. This is a little bit less energy for the same amount of work. It's a little newer, uh, newer, more efficient motor. Uh, this one has a light on it too. So like the drill and the impact driver, there's a little LED that shines down on your work. Just helps you if it's kind of like low lighting. And last but not least, this one also has additional speed control right here. All this does is sort of lock out, sort of like a rev limiter. Basically limit your top speed. So remember I said, if you squeeze the trigger, it's variable speed. The more you squeeze, the faster it goes. If you squeeze it all the way, it goes all the way as fast as it'll go. All this does is kind of stop you halfway or in the middle. So if I want a slow speed, but I don't want to try to hold my finger right there on the very edge and just squeeze a little bit, it might be tiresome after a while. If I put it on one, it will limit how far the trigger actually goes. So I can squeeze the trigger and hold it against the stop, but it won't go uh, all the way as fast as it'll go. Somewhere in the middle is a four or five and all the way to the top, seven is unlimited. So I'm back to the full stroke of the trigger. All the speed is available. 
all the speed in between. So that little knob is just going to give you more speed control if you want to limit your speed a little bit. Pretty identical. This one, this new one, may be a little bit, a little bit lower profile. So like overall height, maybe an inch, an inch shorter. Uh, the motor, a little more compact as far as motor uh, package, a little bit of more efficient motor. Yeah, I don't know. Basically the same. You guys probably can use them without any any trouble at all. Either one, interchangeable. All right.